you know, all of us can have those same attributes, can't we? Yes. We can all have those. Tonight, we're going to shift gears just a little bit, and uh, uh, I want to talk to you about what a born-again person looks like, <coughs> you know? Uh, there's some confusion going on around about now about it, and, and uh, so I want, to, I want to talk to you about that a little bit. <coughs> we'll get into some scripture. It'll be, it'll start over in 2 Peter. Uh, just a moment, but I wanted to start out with a with an illustration for you to kind of set the mode. In Victorian England, treadmills <coughs> weren't found in air conditioned clubs. They weren't even really found in homes of well-to-do people. In fact, where treadmills were found were in prisons. They were put into prisons. You see, treadmills, or when they were back in Victorian England, they were called tread wheels. They were used as a form of punishment for prisoners. Some tread wheels, as they were called, they were hooked up to grinding attachments to grind uh, different grains and transport water and move things around. But most of them typically were just an inclined running surface where a prisoner would go in and they would spend hours running or walking, moving the treadmill. Not accomplishing a thing, just to spending their, a bulk of their day walking up an inclined plane knowing that all their hard labor was for nothing, absolutely nothing. The only hope these prisoners had was that at some point in the future they would have paid their debt to society and could have gotten away from the thing and set free. Prisoners couldn't even look at their labor usually at the end of the, net, of the day and know that if nothing else, they would at least been productive in something. It was just a few instances that there was a grinder hooked to it or a water wheel that anything of any value had been gained. As I walk around and share the gospel, I run into Christians sometimes that look at the Christian life as walking on a treadmill, spending a bulk of their life laboring and not seeing any production. It's like they're serving time in a prison bound to a treadmill having to follow a rule working and seeing no productivity. When I meet these people that view the Christian life as such, my heart goes out to them. Because the Christian life should be one of the most flourishing, exciting activities anybody could ever partake in. Amen. There should be new life around about them. There should be those coming in, being, being joined back into the fellowship of the church that had wandered away. There should be the unchurched being reassigned into a church. There should be the unsaved hearing the gospel and being led to Christ. There should be those that have grown cold being led back and revitalizing their life or rededicating their life. All of those things should be round about a Christian. It's not a non-productive lifestyle where you're bound in and sentenced to a treadmill the rest of your life to labor and produce nothing. It's not so much of a labor, but a joy to serve the Lord. Amen. I want you to remember that even as a Christian, as you struggle with sin in your life and struggles, remember that Christ has set you free. He didn't bind you to something. He didn't sentence you to a treadmill, but He set you free. Whom the Son has set free, the Bible says, is free indeed. That's quite a contrast from some people's idea of what a Christian life is, bound up 
to a treadmill. Well, I got to get up and get on my treadmill and make it move a little bit because that's what Christians do. No, it is not. The Christian life is to be productive. The Christian life is to be like a tree planted by rivers of water that the leaf never withers and the fruit is always in its season. The Bible describes a Christian life as that. Not bound in, having to follow a rule to produce something called a life that really produces nothing outside of itself. Mm -hmm. Where did these ideas come from? And what does a born again person look like? I just praise God tonight none of you wore striped shirts. <laughs> I got a striped shirt. But it's not big and black and white and it's not going this way. We are not prisoners. We're servants. That's right. But we've been set free by the blood of Jesus. Amen. So where does these ideas come from that seem to be non-productive? Let me get to the bottom line. They come from the devil. They come right out of the pit of hell. They're definitely not true. And we know all lies come from the father of lies, and that's the devil. If God says one thing in His Word, and you've heard something different than what's in His Word, what you heard was a lie. What's in God's Word is the truth. Amen. As a mature Christian, then you should have that nailed down. That's a message for another time, but the standard is God's Word. Valerie and I have had six children and none of them had a tag that when they came out of her womb that I pulled on it and out came an instruction book on how to take care and raise that child. But God has given us those things. It's called the Bible. It's the authority on all of life and nowhere in I hear and I've read it cover to cover. I've read even the outside cover of it. And nowhere in here does it describe a non-productive treadmill type of life for those that are found in Christ. I don't find that. I find something else. <laughs> now my personality is a little different than yours maybe. Maybe, maybe we're, we're, we're quite a bit different. But let me tell you something. If I go over here to the Ford dealership and I buy me a brand new car, and, 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 and I bring it home, one, I'm going to be happy I got me a new car. And every one of you, y'all y'all would behave the same way. <laughs> Chances are, once you get it, you'd probably drive it by somebody in your family's uh, in your family to their home and you'd show off what you just got. You'd be really glad and happy. You'd be celebrating to the point that you want somebody else to celebrate that you've got that car. Of course, as soon as you pull out of their driveway, they're going to snicker at you and go, yeah, look at the painting they got now. <laughs> but they're going to celebrate a little bit with you. And you're going to be happy with that. But if I went and I bought a car and you went, I've come to church and I find out you've got the same car I got. Same color, same options, everything. But yet, I find out you got lifetime free oil changes. And you got tires for the life of your car. And you got brakes for the lifetime of your car. And I couldn't even get the windshield washer replaced in it without having to pay a couple dollars. <coughs> And I had to pay for all the other things. And it's the same dealership. I would want to find out who, what salesman you talked to. And if it was Dan Stanley, I'd go talk to him too. I tried to straighten that out. But that wouldn't be right. 
But I can assure you of one thing, that next time I go over to the Ford dealership and buy me a car, I'm going to ask more questions. Because you want to know something, I want, I want all the benefits. Mm -hmm. I want everything that you drove out with, and I want an extra keychain if I can talk them out of it. And when it comes to the life in Christ, and I see somebody walking around with an abundant life, with joy in their heart, with peace in their mind, not full of anxiety, not full of the problems, not full of the stresses of life, and I'm walking around with a burden about to break me in, I'm going to want to seek out and find out what they got. I don't want the same package deal that everybody else got unless I get all the benefits. But I surely don't want to be cheated. And in the Christian walk, when I see some Christians walking with joy in their life, they have issues, they have problems, they have health challenges, build challenges, kids problems. They got every kind of problem that you could probably describe in, in this building tonight. But they've got peace and they got joy. They got a step, uh, a spring in their step, and so forth. And then, yet, if I looked at my own life and I saw myself dragging down and carrying a burden, I'd wonder what's wrong. I'm going to get the instruction book out. I'm going to get it and seek out where did I go wrong? How can I make this deal right? Why, Lord, why can't I get what they've got? How many of you would want to do the same thing that I just described? Yep. How many of you would want to go and get all the good benefits? And if you didn't, would you feel cheated? Mm -hmm. And then when you open up the instruction book and they find out there's words like whosoever joins his family, gets all these benefits. You're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You're on the same level as everybody else and wouldn't you want what everybody else gets? You don't want them to get good stuff and you'd be left out, do you? Mm -hmm. Would you want to find out how they get it? So if you're on a treadmill and somebody else is on a cruise ship, you want to know what they did? They followed the holy instructions from God and you didn't. You followed a lie. You had the wrong salesman. Mm -hmm. The devil told you something and you bought into it. And obviously they found the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. And they're following that, and you're following something else. If you don't have the life of Christ in you, and somebody else does, you might be on two different roads. Just a thought. What are those thoughts? What are those two roads? I'm not talking about the road that leads to destruction. I'm not talking about salvation. If you've, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're saved. But if each one of us tonight, tonight in this room were honest, there's times you feel like you're on a treadmill while everybody else is enjoying the ride. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I told you it's from following a lie. And that lie came from the devil. It came from the pit of hell. And the elements that start messing that up are outside of God's Word and inside the heart of God. It's called religion. It's called tradition. It's things God didn't intend for you to carry. You see, if I, if I drove my Ford Mustang home from the Ford dealership and I'm only getting about nine and a half miles to the gallon, you're getting 34 miles to the gallon, and I'm scratching my head and trying to figure out what is wrong with this thing. <clears throat> it won't pass a gas station. And then I find out, well, the parking brake's been on since I bought it, and I've never released it. So I pull the parking brake off, take it to the dealership, have to put new brakes on it. But then my gas mileage improves. Now I'm not getting the I'm not getting the gas mileage you're getting. I'm only getting about 18 miles to the gallon now. It's better than nine and a half. So I start nosing along, and I can't figure out what it is. I get the manual out. I can't figure out 
at all. Until I go to Harvey's and I come out with groceries and I pop the trunk and I open it up and somebody's filled that thing up with cinder blocks. And I've been carrying a load of concrete blocks around with me. Would that affect my mileage? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It affects my performance. It'll affect the wear, wear and tear on my tires. It'll affect the life of my transmission. And when you're carrying an extra weight in you, it'll be affecting you. Mm -hmm. If you're adding something to God's Word to your life, you're adding a burden Christ didn't accept for you to carry. He, didn't, he did not die to put you on a treadmill. He died to give you life and more abundant. To make you look like Him. To make you look like a Christian. I believe you ought to look like a Christian. So let's go into that. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, whereby, whereby are given unto us, who's it given to? Us. Given to us, right? Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That sounds like a good deal to me. Exceeding great and precious <laughs> promises. That by these you might be partakers of a divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We're told that we are to give exceeding great and precious promises that we might be partakers of the divine nature, the nature of Christ. So we are supposed to start looking like Christ, the divine nature of Him. I'm not talking about we're all going to grow long hair and a beard and dress up in white pajamas or something. That's just one art artist rendition of Jesus. But we're to start looking like Him. We're to be like Him. We're to partake of His divine nature. Why? Having escaped the corruption. That means we've been in prison. Prior to Jesus, we were doomed. We were sentenced to death. But we're, ha we're to escape <coughs> the corruption that is in the world. The first thing that we're supposed to do is we are to start looking like having the very nature of God. One of the earliest Bible verses that I remember learning as a child, and it was just the small one. You know, it, when you were little in a child's Sunday school class, they didn't always give you the whole verse as your memory verse. They'd give you just some of it. Mm -hmm. God is love. It's not even the whole verse. But I remember that when God is love. So as we take on this divine nature, we should start having love. Why? God is love. Didn't He hit you in the face? Yeah, but I love Him. Wouldn't it feel good to hit, good to hit Him? Yeah, but I repented of that. Didn't He deserve it? Absolutely. And in the flesh, I'd smack Him back. But the love of God constrains me not to do that. You start taking on the nature of God. And God is love. You take on that nature. You take on that nature towards your enemies. You take on that nature towards your neighbors. You take on that nature to your brothers and sisters in the church. You take on that nature to your children. You take on that nature to your spouse whenever they've disappointed you and got you angry. You take on the very nature of God. You start looking like Him. You start taking on that nature. So what does a... What does a person that follows God look like? Well, they start taking on the nature of God. Second, they, he has an image which is of God. They take on the nature of God, but they start taking on that very image which is God. Colossians 3.10 tells us this. Listen to this. And they put on the new man. That's why I keep going back and teaching you 
that there's a change necessary when you're born again. <coughs> there is a change necessary. You need to be born again, Jesus told Nicodemus late at night when Nicodemus came up to him and was talking to him that night. You must be born again. Colossians here in this text, it tells you that you have to take on the image. And it says, and you have to put on the new man. You can't wear the old man around all the time. That old man was an old man of sin. It was born into a life of sin. It took on the nature of sin. It had characteristics of sin. It looked and behaved like sin. But Jesus came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. In our verse here it says, and put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of who? The one that created you. Sin has, has changed us to where we don't look much like God. Sin will change you. Living in a world of sin will change you. Now there's good people out there that haven't chosen to follow Christ. They're still in sin. They're nice to be around. They're pleasant. They're fun. And people, people, people feel like they're going to heaven. But if they haven't accepted Jesus, that's the one sin that God cannot forgive, and that's the refusal to accept His Son. That's right. You have to accept Jesus. Refusing Jesus is a sin. Did you know that? And that's the one sin that God cannot forgive. He can, he can forgive the, the murderer, the liar, and the thief. In fact, he can, he can take a, 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 an individual that's a murderer, a liar, and a thief all rolled into one and forgive all of that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing so bad that God can't forgive it. There's just one thing, and that's the refusal to accept His Son as their Lord and Savior. And when you accept Jesus as your Savior, your nature will change, but your image <coughs> will change. I've shared with you time and time again uh, in testimonies of young men that have come down, 19-year-old fellow coming down to an altar who's about over in this area right here. He came down to receive Christ. He got down on his knees. He wadded up his old fist. I think he worked on motorcycles. He had in uh dirt and grease into his hands. He had calluses. He had shook his hand and it almost hurt your hand because he had so much calluses and hardness about him. But he'd been out there doing all sorts of things. Okay? I won't go into everything, but he'd done so much to damage his life in this old world. He was a sinner. He was a good sinner. He did everything he could. I mean, he was involved in all sorts of worldly stuff. And every bit of it had damaged him. And the weight on his shoulders was heavy. But he heard the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news. That that sinner that he was, the Holy Spirit constrained him, made him follow up and come closer to Jesus. Then when he came to Jesus, he said, that's what I want. I want that freedom. I want to be set free. I want to be forgiven. I want God to wipe my slate clean. I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. I'm tired of running my life. I'm going to have Jesus run it for a while. Then he came down and he asked God to forgive him. And my Bible says that when that young man asked God to forgive him, the Bible says that God did. Mm -hmm. And when he said, Jesus, I want you to be Lord and Savior of my life, and I want to follow you the best I can the rest of my life. My Bible says that Jesus came into his heart and became Lord and Savior of his life. And that young man, 19 years old, When he turned around, had some wet on his face where he'd been crying, he was broken. He realized he was a person undone without Christ. He needed something. He was a sinner that needed a Savior. He was a failure that needed to be forgiven. And when God touched him and forgave him, when Jesus became Lord and Savior of his life, his face looked different. The hardness was gone. The grease stains were still there. But the hardness was gone. It was almost, it's hard to describe, but it was like there was a light inside now. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not saying he glowed, but something changed. You could see it. <clears throat> he took on a different nature. He took on a different image. I've seen that at the altar. I have seen that with young men and young women. I saw it with an 88-year-old man I told you about dancing around over here, old Marvin Johnston. I remember him. I remember him dancing around when he got saved. He'd been beating on his wife their whole marriage. He'd been beating on his, his kids just as first thing they did after they got walked. They got beat on by daddy. That didn't let up. And old Stephen Johnston, the big old guy about this tall, about that wide, told stories about whenever he was a senior in high school, getting absolute slop beat, beat out of him by his daddy. What his daddy threatened him, you hit me back, you raise your hand, I will kill you. And his daddy wasn't kidding. So when Stephen Johnson got, Johnson got big enough where he could have defended himself, daddy threatened his life. You're going to stand there and let me beat you. Mean man. But when Jesus came in, he changed. He changed. His nature changed. Mm -hmm. He led most of his family to Christ. The change of his life. His nature changed. He looked different. He wasn't a mean old man <coughs> with a little white beard. He was the sweetest old man in the church that would get, come up and hug you so tight he'd crack your shoulder. If you didn't need a chiropractic adjustment before you met him, you did afterwards. <laughs> there was a change. There was a change in his nature. There was a change in his image. He looked different. He acted different. It changed his neighbors. It led some of them to Jesus. It, it changed family members that knew who he was. Say, so hey, you, you go home. You go home from here tonight. And if you've got family members living around you, they know who you are behind them closed doors. They know what you are. They know who you are. They know the image. They know the reputation you have. You don't hide that from your family. But when Jesus comes in, you'll have a different nature and you'll have a different image. Mm -hmm. You'll get changed. Yes, you will. It's real. I've seen it too many times. Oh, Marvin tonight, did he change? He changed. Got to dancing in circles. He explained it. And I told you. And I don't mean to be redundant with it, but it's a wonderful story, in my opinion. Marvin, why are you dancing? He said, I've been dancing with the devil my whole life, and I just changed partners. Molly, later that night, I've never shared this, but later that night outside the church, she came up to me with tears in her eyes and everything else, and she said, Pastor, I need to talk. I said, Molly, what's wrong? She says, Marvin won't be able to serve the Lord as long as he served the devil. Isn't that a shame? But isn't it good that we got a God that didn't keep the record and yes. wiped it completely out? Absolutely. You see, God didn't keep up with the 88 years he had served sin, but he gave him an eternity, blessed with life, with a new image, <coughs> a new nature. <coughs> God. He has a new image from God. And let me tell you something else. A person that follows God, he has a holiness which is from God. I'm not talking about tradition and religion. I'm talking about a true holiness. A desire not to have sin in their life. A church member that comes up and says, Preacher, how much drinking can a guy do and still go to heaven? They don't make enough alcohol to put down your gut to send you to hell. You might be surprised that I'd say that. The alcohol don't send you to hell. The refusal to accept Christ is what puts you there. 
But how much sin can you have in your life is not the holiness that comes from God. That is not what we're to take on. When you're still negotiating how much garbage you can have in your life, let me tell you what, have y'all have you ever had a rotten potato in your kitchen? Yeah, Christy, that's a nasty smell. <laughs> it's like something's dead. Something's wrong. Christians that want to see how much sin's in their life is like running around with a rotten potato in your pocket. That's the stench that goes up before God. Amen. I don't believe our Father sat up there on His throne and, asked, and sent His Son down that day in Bethlehem to be born in the flesh for us to have rotten stuff on us after that sacrifice was made and the price was paid. Well, it's just a small potato. If you've ever had one go bad in your kitchen, It'll make you snoop around until you find out where it's at. We used to put them under the seats of our buddy's cars. <laughs> That's nasty smell. You don't want me mad at you. <laughs> I'm telling you all about things that I did that wasn't godly. But I've asked God to forgive me of all those things. But God paid such a precious price for you that we're not to negotiate unholy things into our lives. The enemy is in because we're born into a life of sin. We're born in a world of sin. We're, that's our nature. But Christ died that we could be freed from that and give us a new nature and give us a new image so that we it changes us. And the very demons and problems that were in our lives before Christ was accepted into our lives and Jesus became our Lord and our Savior. Why in the world would we go up and open the gate and let some demon come back in? Even though he looks like a little demon. It's not a bad one. Preacher, this one's in everybody's home. Everybody does it. No, they don't. No, they don't. Because my Bible says that we are saved from that sin and God puts a nature and an awareness in that says, no, we don't do that. We don't live that way. That's like going and getting a brand new Easter suit and walking out in the mud and dropping, just grabbing a handful of mud and splattering it on ourselves. Why would you do that? You wouldn't do that. Even as a little child, I remember getting a new new outfit for Easter, new shoes and everything. And my problem was I'd scuff my shoes up. I'd scuff my shoes up. You polish those things out. I I couldn't walk three feet without putting a scuff mark on the side of them. My mom would want to spit shine. I'd be down there with a brush trying to get it. Easter Sunday morning, we'd go to church. Sometimes our shoes would be off up in the back window so that we wouldn't bang them together. We'd get there and get them on, and Mom would have a shoe brush. And before we'd go to Sunday school, she'd have us pick up our shoes, buff those things out, get them perfect, and before we got Sunday school class, I had knots all over mine. <coughs> it bothered me to have something nice and get it messed up. Why do you negotiate holiness out of your life? God saves you and redeems you from that. And we open the gate to let it in. And God's standing there telling you, everybody doesn't live that way. The world will lie to you and tell you that. But God wouldn't tell you that. His Word doesn't tell you that. Your preacher doesn't tell you that. Your teachers don't tell you that. It's just the world that's telling you that. And Christians that try to negotiate sin into their lives have got a problem. They're refusing the nature and the very image of God by allowing something unholy into their lives. I've shared with you before the story of the nice teacup. Putting something dirty in your teacup makes the teacup undesirable. It could be the finest teacup in the world. And when God saves you, you're so clean. When God 
cleanses you, forgives you of your sin, and Jesus comes into your life, there's not a pastor or an evangelist anywhere that's cleaner than you are at that moment. And then we start piling garbage into that and making it something undesirable. What does a... What does a born-again person look like? They have a new image. They have a new nature about them. And they have a holiness, which is from God. Look over in 1 John 3, 9. 1 John 3, 9. One of the little books. Listen to this. It's talking about a holiness, which is from God. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. What does it say? Let's take the first part. Whosoever is born of God does not sin. When you come to Jesus Christ, when God forgives you of your sin, your nature is changed in such a way, holiness is installed as a super option into your life. Holiness is, is something God gives you. It comes from Him. And you don't want to sin. The desires of your heart, when you become saved, when you give your heart over to God, when you start to live for Christ, your intention is not to go out and see how much sin it is. Your intention at that moment is to live a holy, a pure, a godly life. You give it a little bit of time and this whole world will teach you some new sins I want. <coughs> Things I didn't, I didn't even know that was out there. That sounded like fun. And for a season it might be. But the one that's born of God says does not commit sin. That's not your nature. You've got a new nature. And your nature is to live a holy life. Why? For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. There's a new seed that's been put in. And it's not the seed of sin. It's not the seed of Adam. It's the seed of Jesus Christ through His blood and His sacrifice that is now in the, in, inside of you, and you're born of God. That holiness, it comes from God. Jesus said, if I abide in you and you abide in me, wow, you live the type of life that He intended. Y'all remember the morning I brought the fish bowl in with the little fish and, 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 and got the dip net, and I was talking about abiding in Him and Him abiding in you and how that fish was in the water but the water was also in the fish. And I pulled that, I pulled, pulled the little fish out with a dip net and I'm standing there and I'm preaching to you and Lee is about to die because I've got the fish hanging out of the water. And I'm preaching and he's wiggling a little bit. And the more I preach, the sicker she's getting because I'm going to kill that fish. She just knows I'm going to kill the fish. The problem was is that fish had been in the water and the water was in the fish and it was fine. We named that fish preacher, and he, he, he died a little while ago, but he lived a good long life. Mm -hmm. He'd come up, take food out of your fingers when you brought it over, and he'd follow you around. And when you'd come in in the morning, he got all excited. So I had Scooter wiggling on the floor and him wiggling up in his tank. <laughs> Both of them wanting attention. When you're born of God, you have the very seed of God in you. It's a new seed. It gives you a new nature. It gives you a new image. It gives you holiness. You have the desire. And when you stop living for Christ, then the seed of man, that nature of sin, creeps into your life. Mm -hmm. Because you have the carnal nature and you have the godly nature. You've been born again. And you have a chance to live a holy life. But all of us in this room know that that old carnal nature comes up sometimes. And the desires of the flesh to entertain ourselves and to do things that are fun for a season comes up. And when we yield to that, we pull away from this side. But the thing is, if we yield to the things of God, we pull away from the carnal side. And they get less and less. 
as we grow in Christ. But if you draw close to the world and you open the gates for them demons to come in and bring things into your home and into your life that you know are ungodly, when you start negotiating sin into your life, then the things of God get less and less. Before long, you walk like the world, you talk like the world, you act like the world. Like I said, when it was shared to me that one of our members was over there witnessing, trying to lead somebody to Jesus. And as a pastor, that would make you proud. But then they said, yeah, and then they fell off the stool over at White Horse. <laughs> they, they're saved. They know Jesus. But they had negotiated enough sin into their lives that they thought they could sit on a bar stool at the White Horse getting drunk. And God and the things of God and Christ had become so small to them that they fell off the stool. So don't tell me those things can't happen. In fact, when I talked to this person about what had happened, in their conversation they said, Brother Steve, you know the thing that bothers me the most? I don't think I've ever shared Christ with anybody sober. Why is it we have to get drunk to talk about Jesus? I'm glad there was something inside of him and a seed that made that the topic of conversation. But the sad thing is, is the reputation was not good enough to influence people. You have to be careful. Pray for these people. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. God's still with you. He said he'd never leave you nor forsake you. That's what Jesus said. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. If you're with Jesus, you can't drag sin in. The minute you're letting sin in, you're no longer with Jesus. You've walked away. Be careful. So how does a born-again person look like? What does it look like? He has a love which is like God. 1 John 5, 2, and in closing, he has a love which is like God. By this we know that we love the children of God. Who do you love? <clears throat> the children of God. That's your brothers and sisters, isn't it? By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Hmm. Commandments simply stated are the things that Christ has taught us. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. What does a born again person look like? He, they have a love which is like God. When you were in your deepest, darkest part of sin, did God love you? Yes. Then we're to love our brothers and sisters when they're sin sin. What if their clothes don't meet certain standards? Are we supposed to love them? Yes. What if they don't drive a new car and can't afford it? Do we love them? Mm -hmm. What if they've got unruly children? Do we love them? Does God love them? I know my oldest brother got in a situation where he owed a lot of money and they were struggling financially. He was working, he was a city of Atlanta policeman and working side jobs trying to be, meet all his bills. I went over to his house one day to help him put a roof on his house and at lunchtime we were called down off the roof and Donna had some homemade vegetable soup and I dearly love that stuff. Came down, she had a little thing of cornbread and some, some uh, uh, soup sitting there. Tommy, after he said the blessing, we started eating it. 
And he said, Donna, what's wrong with the soup? She said, well, I didn't know you were having two of your brothers over and I didn't make enough, so I just put some water in it to stretch it. It wasn't as good as it usually would have been. I'm glad she was trying to stretch it, but it had not been on the stove long enough to heat the water back up good. And it was noticeable it had been watered down. That's when I became aware that my brother and sister-in-law and my niece and my nephew didn't have hardly any food in the house. That evening, they had food in the house. I would not let my brother not have food. He was embarrassed. He didn't like admitting it. Vietnam vet, city of Atlanta police, undercover vice, tough man. He was a hard worker. Mm -hmm. Didn't like the idea that little Bubba, that's what he called me, little Bubba found out he needed help. He got it. Told him, don't worry about it. I loved him. He wasn't going to go hungry. How do we treat our brother? How do we treat our sister? How do we treat our neighbors out here? If they're in need and God has blessed us, we're to love them. Why? Because to be like God and to look like our Lord and our Savior, you have a love which is like God. 1 John 5, 2, we read it. By this we know that we have that we love the by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Hmm. It's part of our image. It's part of what a Christian looks like. <coughs> Let me go back through this real quick with you. If you don't have a nature which is from God, you're probably on a treadmill. If you don't have an image which is from God, you might be running on a treadmill. <coughs> if you don't have holiness which comes from God, you might be walking, laboring on a treadmill. And if you don't have love, which is like our Lord and our Savior, you might be on a treadmill. But if you have a nature which is from God, you might be laboring for the Lord and not on a treadmill. You'll be productive. If you have a very image of God in your life, You'll find that you're productive. And that seed that's planted in your life is flourishing. And you're not on that treadmill. But a life of joy. If you have holiness in your life and not negotiating sin, you'll find you're probably being productive in life for the Lord and His kingdom and His work. And not on a treadmill following rituals and traditions. But the joy of the Lord has become your strength. If you have the love which is like God's, you'll find probably that people are drawn to you and you're influential within your community. So when you look at them and you say, hey, you need to come to church and be with us. we got to go <coughs> Monday night. we got to sing on Thursday. It's going to be fun. We're going to have some good fellowship. If you have the love of God in you, you'll influence people and you don't have to worry about dragging them in. You can influence them in. Or like the Bible says, out in the highways and hedges, you'll be compelling them to come in that his house might be full. Mm -hmm. If you're doing what God wants you to do the way God wants you to do it, you're probably not on a treadmill. But you'll be productive. <coughs> in closing tonight, the altar is always <coughs> open here. You know that. If you need time at the altar, then the invitation is here. We'll be closing in just a few minutes.
Does anybody have any needs? We look around. Thank y'all for being here tonight. I know it's Mama's Day night. Y'all's church isn't open, is it? Y'all are all, you know, you, you know, anytime you can, come on over here. But y'all, if there's any needs, come. Just a handful of us here tonight. <coughs> that doesn't mean, mean that the need you might have in your life isn't huge. If you're off base with God, you're in danger. In fact, by tonight's message, if you're off base a little bit, you're running a treadmill. I don't know if you know what that's like, but I've been on it. No fun. It just wears you out. And you get nowhere. <coughs> But putting just a little bit in the hands of our Lord and Savior is like the boy with the loaves and the fishes. There's no telling what God can do with it. You'll be productive. If you'll take on the things we talked about tonight into your life, repent when you walk away. And there's nothing wrong with that word. word. <coughs> Maybe some of us have learned that, it, oh, if I have to repent, that means I'm off in a deep dark. See it. No, you just might be heading in the wrong direction and you're in danger. Change direction. Go back to God. That's all repent means. That's a good thing. If I hadn't repented, I'd be bound for hell. Unsaved. I learned something about repentance. Do it as often as you need to. The altar's open if you need it. I'll pray with you if you want me to. <clears throat> but if you just need to straighten some things out, now's the time to do it. We'll be dismissing in just a few minutes. I just pray that God's grace shines down on each and every one of you. That His favor goes with you. That you're blessed. And that you're willing to receive what God has for you. If you're tired, look at the things that we've gone over tonight. If you're weary and laboring over some things, the devil may have you on a treadmill running you to death. Getting nowhere. But if you're productive in the kingdom of God, you'll have the attributes and the things that we talked about tonight. That's for you to measure. Thank you all for being here. Bow your heads and close your eyes and we'll dismiss. Father, I thank you this evening for allowing us to come in. Lord God, I thank you for the guests and the visitors tonight. Father, and those that weren't able to be with us this morning. Father, we thank you for the whole day. Lord God, it was a sweet spirit this morning. Lord God, you've repeated it again tonight. I thank you for the opportunity to praise you and lift you up. Lord, in our song and our worship, our praise, Lord God, and then in the word. Father, apply this tonight to us that we can take on the very image of you. That, Lord God, as we're part of the family of Christ, that, Lord God, we'll take on the very image and the nature and the love and the holiness from you. Lord God, keep this message alive in us this week. Lord, give us opportunity to draw closer to you. Help us to grow in you, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.